I mean, as I said to Nadine, I mean, surely... Actually, it was a catastrophe, wasn't it, these uh, by-election results? Because you should have devoted more uh, resource to Stoke, and maybe you could have won that too. Oh, there's no way you could describe this as a catastrophe <laughs> for us. No, we were delighted to win in Copeland, and we ran quite close in Stoke. Um, it, both results were excellent, but obviously we like actually winning, and so the one in Copeland is a real triumph. Now, uh, this swing to you and the popularity of Theresa May, you can't assume that it's going on it's going to go on forever. You've got a very narrow majority in the House of Commons. You would be absolutely tonto not to have a general election. <laughs> Soon. No, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, the fact is, one of the reasons why I think we did very well is because people do trust Theresa May. She has a wide reach. That whole One Nation approach has been accepted. And the fact that, you know, people in Copeland who voted Labour all their life have turned to Conservative, I think, is about her leadership. We're showing that the Conservatives do have this much broader reach than people thought. But I don't no, but think... No, but hang on a second. But you've got these really tough things to do, whether it's delivering Brexit, whether it's keeping Scotland uh, in the Union, whether it's sorting out the health service. You know, the, the reality is a bigger majority in the House of Commons would be an enormous help. So why not try and secure that majority? Since right now, if she went to the country, it looks as though you would win by a landslide. Well, the thing is about the Prime Minister is she has said she doesn't want to have an election. And one of the things that people really appreciate about the Prime Minister is she means what she says. And the fact is, I think as well, that the public have had enough of elections at the moment. I think there's a little bit of fatigue. It was only less than two years ago. We had the general election. Then we've had the referendum. I think what the public want us to do, which is what we're doing, is getting on and delivering on the outcome of Brexit, but also getting on with doing the other things we want to do. You know, the other social reform elements that are very close to well, her let's, heart. Let, let's get on to that in a second. But just finally, while we're talking about those results, for years, there was a perception that the rise of UKIP was bossing effectually, effectively where the Tory party was going. Do you think UKIP is now a dead force in British politics? Listen, the thing about British politics, as we've seen over the past two years, is it's very difficult to anticipate. It's a very volatile, fe sort of feverish view out there of who's going to vote for who and when they're going to do it. But one thing we did see is that Labour have taken their vote for granted. In Copeland, they ran the same old campaign about the NHS, trying to frighten people. Conservatives do not take the vote for granted. And I think that's going to be the main differentiation. Now, very interesting leak in the Sunday Times about something that you're working on, you know, at the moment, which is immigration policy, taking back control of who comes here. First question, when will we see the first sort of official statements from you on all this? When will we see the famous consultation paper? Well, th there's two elements, if I may, yeah. on EU immigration. The first one, which the Prime Minister has said she wants to do as soon as possible, mm. is giving certainty to the EU people who are here, people who contribute to the economy, who make a really valuable but How soon part. do you think we could see that certainty given? Well, she wants to do it as soon as possible. As so, soon if as triggers, so, so, so if she triggers Article 50, yeah. let's say mid-March, yeah. how soon after that well, could that we will see depend it? on the negotiations negotiations with the EU. But a matter of weeks, possibly, in your opinion. Who knows? I mean, the fact is, she said it's going to be an early priority. As right. soon as we can get reciprocity, reciprocity, so the UK people in the EU are also secure, because we've got to look after them as well. But we recognise the fact that EU citizens here want that certainty. So just to be to absolutely clear, it to it's really her top priority for the early stage of the Article 50... It is, it is certainly a priority, because we recognise the difficulty the EU citizens have here. They're important to us, and yeah. we want to make sure that we give that as soon as possible. So that's, so that's the first yes. thing to Indeed. But then there is this wider question about who can come here, whether they can work, uh, when are we going to learn more about that from you? Of course. And my, my office is working on a range of different options. And one of the first things we're going to do is a consultation. We hope to do it over the summer. We're going to engage with businesses and other stakeholders. There's always a lot of anecdotal evidence about who's coming, who's going. But we want to make sure that any future policy is based on fact. Now, the, Sunday, the Sunday Times mm. says that the preferred option at the moment is a five-year work visa. Now, the sense I'd always had from you is that you preferred a work permit system and allowing people to come in in the normal way on, you know, as, as, as tourists and visitors. You know, a work visa system would be rather different from that, wouldn't it? It would be rather different from that, and all I can say at the moment is we're working on a range of options. There's so that is an option, but it's not the preferred option it's, yet? It, there are a lot of different options that the Home Office is working on. It would be a mistake for me to go any further than that at the moment. There's going to be two years of negotiations and preparation. We can't give comments every week, but we're looking at all the different 
different options. But presumably, and particularly since this is a pretty contentious issue, uh, it has been for the Tory vote for some time, the other element that the Sunday Times talks about, which is no ability to draw benefits if you come here to work, that presumably is true. That, that also is part of the range of options we're looking at. One thing I can confirm is we'll be ending freedom of movement as we know it. Otherwise, we're looking at all sorts of different alternatives. How fast would you think you'd be able to implement the new regulations? As, you know, you're going to decide them, but then how, how quickly would they come well, in? Well, Robert, it depends on what they are. I mean, we're going to have, we're looking at, a, 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 as I say, a range of options, and how they're implemented and what time it will take will depend on the final uh, arrangement that we have for setting it up. But do you agree with David Davis and the remarks he gave when in Eastern Europe earlier, or just last week, as it were, that because of the dependence of so many industries in the UK on migrant uh, employees, labour of various sorts, that you can't just bring the drawbridge or lift the drawbridge up, that we're going to continue to have to take quite large numbers for a number of years? I think what he's highlighting is the fact that as a government, we're going to work with businesses, with employers, to make sure that the immigration system we put in place does enable them to continue to thrive and continue yeah. to grow. What shape that will be, we can't say yet. Um, but just so to be absolutely clear, there's not going to be this sort of cliff edge where all of a sudden, you know, the, the numbers coming in are going to be massively restricted, because obviously this is something that businesses are deeply concerned of about. Of course, and we're against cliff edges. So as part of the consultation that we'll be bringing out in the summer, we'll be asking them the best way to deliver that. Now, the other story around today is uh, from the new advisor on terrorism legislation, Max Hill, who says that for him, this is the most dangerous time in terms of terrorist threats, uh, well, in living memory. Do, do you agree with that? I judgment? do agree with that. I mean, he's drawn particular attention to the fact that, you know, we were in danger dangerous times with the Northern Ireland troubles and the Cold War, but now we are also in dangerous times. As he reported, the level of danger is severe, which means we think an attack is likely. How, how much of your time is devoted to protection against I think it's the most important thing a Home Secretary does is make sure that she or he focuses on making sure that the country is defended and well looked after. And so uh, broadly at the moment that is absolutely your main priority? That is my main priority, yes. Did it um, have an impact on your decision to appoint Cressida Dick as our top policeman in this country? I, I, head of the, head of I'm the just Police. delighted to appoint Cressida Dick. She has such a strong background. She has a counter-terrorism background. She has a counter-terrorism background. And was that part of her pitch to you? Yeah, that was part of her pitch to us and it was also part of the pitch in terms of defending London, making sure that London stays safe, which is sometimes a target. But more than that, with Cressida Dick, like me, she shares a focus on wanting to help the vulnerable. And she says she's going to do that. She's going to focus on child sexual exploitation and making sure that women are looked after. So I particularly like the fact that she could, she's able to do both. In one respect, a controversial appointment. The family of Jean-Charles de Menezes upset that she's got this yes. uh, job because, you know, famously she was in the control room when this innocent man was shot as a suspected terrorist. How did you confront that issue with her when talking, to, talking with her before the appointment? Well, of course, um, we, we did discuss it. And her view is, as mine is, that it was a terrible tragedy, terrible for the family. Uh, the fact is she herself was exonerated by a jury, so I believe she will nevertheless be a very good uh, leader. So we'll be coming back to discuss so much more with you in just a moment. Don't go away. More from Amber, Amber Rudd after the break. Welcome back to Peston on Sunday. Well, I locked Amber Rudd in a detention centre, so she's still here. But first, Allegra, what's the word on social media? Well... As Amber Rudd has been discussing, Home Secretaries obsess about immigration numbers, so we thought we would have a look at those numbers. Um, this is basically... The Home Secretary shifts in her seat. This is basically Tory government start here, coalition. It's OK, um, it goes down a bit, but from 2012, they go up. It's an, basically an upward trend. Everyone would agree with that. Then let's look at the rhetoric. These are just the select highlights. Um, as immigration hits 200,000, we have the famous go-home vans. Then in 2015, we have Theresa May conference comments that immigration or rising immigration makes it impossible to build a cohesive society. And then Amber Rudd's foray into the suggestion that there would be a foreign workers register, all firms publishing how many foreign workers they have. It emerged at party conference. It was speedily killed. Now, you can see here, this little line is a dip 
Brexit referendum is just here. Too soon to tell what that's about. But let's focus on this. We know that Amber Rudd was uncomfortable about that because we got the following newspaper headlines. Um, uh, <laughs> not subtle, don't call me racist. The question is, if we really do start to see immigration numbers come down, do we get a dialing down of the language that you're clearly uncomfortable with? Um, so I think one of the things that's sort of implicit in what uh, Allegra was just saying uh, is, of course, that you're doing a job that the Prime Minister uh, did for a number of years, and you know many think that she was the most successful Home Secretary for a generation. Does that make it harder? Do you feel more pressure, given that you know, Downing Street and the Prime Minister in particular knows a thing or two about your brief? No, I don't. I mean, I think it's pretty helpful. The fact is, she knows the challenges within the brief. I do speak to her, you know, when I can, when I have a particular issue I want to, and I find it very constructive. Is she backseat driving? Absolutely not, but she is very helpful to me. I mean, sometimes Prime Ministers ask Home Secretaries to do things and they have no idea that there are reasons why it can't happen. The thing about the Prime Minister, she knows what can and can't be done, and I can have a very frank conversation with her. Now, one of the things that you said that did cause the odd wave was the reintroducing restrictions on child refugees coming to this country. You faced a lot of criticism. Uh, you defended it by saying that in some sense it was a magnet for traffickers, but actually a lot of charities are saying that's not true. Is there any chance that you will go back on what you've announced and let more child refugees in? Okay, just in your question, yeah. it shows that unfortunately the wrong uh, fake news is settling out there, shall we say. The fact is we took 8,000 children last year into yeah. this country and settled them. 3,000 arrived unaccompanied and illegally and have been settled here. These numbers are large. We have some of the largest... But Lord Dubbs no, okay, was, was clear in his mind that a promise had been, a commitment had been given to him to take several thousand from France, and that's not happening. No, that's absolutely not true. Uh, Lord Dubbs will have been clear that the amendment, because every word was uh, haggled over and decided over last year, that there would be a consultation with, with councils, and we'd come back with a number, that it would be one-off system. Um, at the same time, the councils have agreed to take 3,000 from the region. How yeah, how but much from more vulnerable? the region, but, but not those who are vulnerable across the channel. But how much, where are the most vulnerable children? Are they in the region or are they in France and Italy and Greece? They're in the region. That's why we're focused on the region. And in terms of the European children, we are helping. We have a fund that helps £10 million, which helps the children in France, in Germany, in, sorry, not in Germany, in Greece and in Italy. And at the end of last year, in order to help with the Calais clearance, we did a one-off acceptance of 900 children in order to make sure that we did. We do think, I do think, that it's a pull factor if you say we'll continue to take children from Europe. What happened in Calais is the number of children doubled over three weeks. How did that double? Because traffickers brought them there and the age of children began to fall because we said we'd take the youngest children first. If you set up a system of taking children from Europe, the traffickers will bring you the children. It's not the right thing to do. I mean, the do. perception is that this is about money. But at the end of the day, at a time when money is very tight, the government just did not want to put particularly councils under more funding pressure. Well, we, we agreed to go out and consult with the councils. They came back with this number. It's right that they have to help make those decisions. I don't think it is about money, Robert. It's about making sure that we do the right thing. It's easy to be compassionate. It's less easy to put together the right policies that actually look after the most vulnerable children. Now, a uh, very senior Tory who I imagine you admire, Lord Heseltine, has said today that he is going to vote against the government in the House of Lords on this Article 50 vote. How serious is that? Well, we'll see. I mean, I would, I think that Are you disappointed article, in Lord Heseltine? I think his article was slightly more nuanced than that. And... Uh, the fact is, the House of Commons, which he was such a fantastic member of in his time, um, did pass it by a big majority. I hope he'll reconsider. There'll be plenty of opportunities to debate and consider the negotiations over the next couple of years. The point about this bill, this short two-clause bill, is to give the Prime Minister the permission to go ahead and invoke Article 50. I'd like it unamended. Do you think there's any possibility of the government, Theresa May, let's be clear when we talk about this, uh, agreeing to any amendments sticking in the bill? No, I don't think there is any possibility, and I don't think there should be. This is a process bill. It's just about beginning the process for the two years that we're going to need the time in order to prepare for leaving. Then within that, there'll be the opportunities to debate and discuss. But what is the point of Parliament if, 
when it comes to it, you know, a majority of Lords and potentially a majority of MPs, you know, vote, vote for an amendment and you just continue to knock it back and forth? Well, actually, the MPs, the elected House, sure. voted it straight through. We want the House of Lords to do the same. Lovely to speak to you. And 